to perhaps if you get to a very high level of knowledge, how do you then um, how do you then when someone below you in knowledge gives you maybe advice or he gives you some nasiha, how do you then take it on without looking down and saying I need that already or uh, why are you telling me this? Understood. Questions regarding sincerity. In the manual, you spoke on sincerity, etc. Once a person reaches a level of mastery, a high station, high status, and someone who is hypothetically beneath him or under him, less learned as he is, he gives you advice, etc., etc., etc. Khair, inshallah. What do you do? How do you behave? How do you react, etc.? Well, first and foremost, the religion is bigger and greater than all of us. All of us. No one is above the deen. And the deen, according to the Prophet, is nasiha. That's all it is. It's a deenun nasiha. Transparency, purity. And from transparency and purity is sincere advice, keeping it real. I feel you said something or did something or doing something wrong. I'm not going to hide it. I screen it, cover it, but I'm going to transparently show you what's here. That's what nasiha is. So no alim is above that. And anyone who has become an alim or learned a strong suit of knowledge, he is supposed to know that already. So, jazakallah khairan. Thank you. I, I'm learned. You're not so learned, but what you said is right. Jazakallah khairan. I appreciate it. You don't have to teach me something to give me advice. You can remind me. I may have forgotten, or maybe I was tired, or maybe I was preoccupied, or it slipped my mind. Jazakallah khairan. And of course, a person isn't to be uh, full of pride, arrogance, or conceit. Even if the person who gives him advice, gives him advice incorrectly, disrespectfully. The way that you said it was, wasn't right. You should have, but even so, the haq is the haq. Sheikh. Abu Fulan, Hafidhukallah, no, hey, you did that wrong. Such and such, okay, just like, okay, that's it. It's that simple. You have the duty and responsibility of giving advice in the correct manner. I have the duty and responsibility of accepting the facts. But the problem lies in what happens when I don't agree with your advice. And then the arrogance is now reversed to the other side. Listen carefully now. So the first scenario is, there is a brother who is learned. He's virtuous. His ilm is known. His virtue is known. Someone comes and advises this brother, alim, student, whatever, who's far less learned, if learned at all. Far less virtuous, if virtuous at all. Right or wrong? So the learned, virtuous brother has the responsibility of accepting the haq. The less virtuous, less learned brother has the responsibility of giving the advice with respect. Because he's a Muslim, first and foremost. Forget Medina overseas, he's Muslim. Karamatul Muslim. Let alone he's learning. Let alone this, let alone that, etc., etc., etc. Right or wrong? Okay? So it's his job to humble himself. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you. Shukran. That's it. Accept the truth, if it's the truth. But the problem that we suffer from, whether it be here or America, is what happens if you give me advice or you enjoin the good and forbid the evil that I don't agree with. Rather, I feel that you're wrong. I was right in doing this, but you never read that hadith. You, you can't understand Arabic, whatever the case may be. So I don't accept your advice. Now the advisor, he turns around and now he gets the arrogance. He didn't take my advice. He's arrogant. He said, whoa, whoa, whoa slow down. Who said that your understanding of Islam, your brand of Islam, your faham, who said that that's correct? Who said that? And who said that? that's what I agree with? You see the mushkina now, how the shaitan plays games? So one person accuses one of being arrogant, then the next one falls into the same thing. You have to take my nasiha. You have to take my understanding. It's not something that's agreed upon. Something that's clear. Something that's... Factually based, the sunnah is crystal clear versus something ishtihad, it's a different understanding. Rather, bell, rather, anta al you are wrong. 
And one of the reasons why you're wrong is because you're the joy hill. You're ignorant. And it doesn't mean that the ignorant person can never be right and the Adam can never be wrong, but you don't have the what? The fahim, aslan. You see something wrong which isn't wrong, let alone haste. It's hasty. Let alone, yani, ta'ifiyah. The fanaticism. Your, your group, your clique. All right? They never did it like this. Your gang, your band. So it automatically means that what? That person's just wrong. That's a big, big, big problem. So the summary is, is that a nasiha, enjoying the good, forbidding the evil, alam ibn ra'uf, al munkar, it needs fiqh. The proper fiqh. The proper understanding, and it needs adab. It's in their manners to enjoy the good and forbidden the evil. I have to accept the truth even if you say it in a rude manner. I have to accept the truth even if you're not my friend, if you're an enemy, quote unquote. And inshallah, hopefully no Muslim will be an enemy of another Muslim, hopefully. Right? The Prophet, he accepted the truth from whoever brought it. But don't force your advice on a person. And that's also a mark of lack of sincerity. Allahu alam, who's sincere, who isn't? Min alamat. And the signs that a person is sincere is that they're aggressive and forcing the nasiha on you. We gave you advice. Jazakallah khairan. Whether I agree or whether I disagree, but I thank you for the advice. Why didn't you take it? We advised you. I advised you. And then it becomes a hunt. They're hunting you down. We advised you. Why didn't you change it? Why didn't you fix it yet? Why didn't you fix it? I give you advice. Your beard is supposed to be longer. You can't trim your beard. Your brother says, Jazakallah khairan. Thank you. I'll come back a week later. Where's your beard? It's supposed to be long. Something's off now. If I'm truly sincere and honest, the first advice that you did not outwardly reject is what? That's enough. Why are you pressing and sweating and harassing the person that you advised unless you have an ulterior motive? There's a hidden agenda that you have, and that isn't for your benefit, but it is something else. You guys get the point? And I can't explain in words how ruinous this is and how strong it is in this country and in other countries. And just stop and think about it. Think how many examples just like this. Brother is forcing his advice upon the next brother. Sister is forcing her medhab upon the next sister. Forcing her understanding upon the next person. And then comes the slander, the bad words, the name calling, the disrespect, the humiliation, etc. All of that came from Adin al nasiha But it doesn't mean that you have to bring the nasiha on a silver plate for it to be accepted. You're wrong for being disrespectful. You're wrong for talking to that, that person like that. But it doesn't mean that what you said is what? Wrong. Wallahu ta'ala adam. Questions come from the sisters that states how to get rid of blood suckers. It's rough. It's difficult. First step of getting rid of a blood sucker is realizing that there are blood suckers. And to realize the danger of a blood sucker and of a parasite. And that the blood sucker and the parasite, its existence is to suck and to sap. It lives and thrives off of taking from you. It's something that cannot be welcomed. You can't be laxed and you know laid back. You have to take and make a campaign against it. Anything taking my energy, my effort, my money, my concentration, and my focus from my studies has to be fought. A war is waged against it. It's not, oh, let me let my guard down. It's okay. Abedin. Anyone, any person, man, woman, child that's distracting you from your focus, from your mission. So that's the first step. Secondly, you take progressive steps piece by piece. Every, the war can't, is not fought and won in one day. There are battles. There are things that lead up to the battles. There are battles that lead up to bigger battles, so on and so forth. And you know your life better than anyone else. You have a problem with social media. You have a problem with gossiping. You have a problem with uh, wasting money, going shopping, whatever the case may be. You have to cut the cancer off from its root. You know yourself. Don't even put yourself in a position of weakness to be put through the fitna. Avoid it. So on and so forth. Wallahu How to make dawah to your Muslim family that is sometimes involved in bid'ah. Make dua for them before you even speak to them. Pray for them. Ask Allah to guide them. Ask Allah to open their hearts, to open their minds. Ask Allah to give them the strength 
And then you speak to them kindly, gently, with rifq, with hilm. You be forbearing and tolerant. Okay? Don't force it upon them. Just show them. Share with them your personal experience. You can go to a Muslim sometimes and you don't have to tell them, this is bid'ah, this is sunnah. You can just share with them your personal experience. Hey, let me show you something real quick. I learned this when I was here. Can I show you? That's all you have to say sometimes. Oh, really? Yeah, you can pray like this. That's all you have to say. This is wrong. You're doing this wrong. You have to do this right. That's, that's something that once you come like that, the person is going to put up their guard. Versus, let me share with you what I learned. Hey, let me teach you something that I came across. This is a really good book. Which, versus you have to read this and you have to burn your other book. It's a problem. Okay? Don't force your family. Don't rush your family. Give them time. Be patient. Allah Azza didn't destroy you when you were doing those, those sins. You're smoking weed. It's a fact. And your parents were patient with you. Allah didn't punish you when you were smoking weed. You, you, have, you have tattoos on your body. You have a thobe one now. You have a long beard now. But Allah knows, and the people who, who, who were there with you, they know that you have what? Tattoos. You had how many girlfriends? You did this, you did that, you sold drugs. Whatever the case may be, Allah knows, and Allah was patient with you. You're still living. Allah gave you an opportunity to make toba. So why do you rush and aggressively, ferociously go for the juggler vein of your family members or your friends? You got to change right now. You got to get rid of it right now. And if not, I doom you to hell. That's going, that's, that's going to do nothing but push the people away. So have patience. Have knowledge. Have rifq. And have sabr. As we explained from Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. Extremely important. Especially in your family. Don't badger them. Don't abuse them. Give them the advice. Offer them the advice. Keep the door open. And the rest is in Allah's hands. And just because you made the jump into uh, to light speed or hyperspace. Doesn't mean that your brother or your father or your uncle is going to do the same. Your beard, what does it look like? What did your pants look like? Like I said, let alone clear, open, ma'asiya, et cetera, et cetera. You made the jump. Allah open your heart. Be patient for them to do so if Allah wills. And if Allah doesn't will, it's still your family. You give them your rights. You practice your religion. And you move forward. We don't have to discuss religion at the dinner table. We don't have to talk about the sunnah because it didn't work. It turns to an argument. The food is good. Jazakallah khairan. How you guys doing? How's, you know, you talk about football. You know, you're in college. It's your family. You give them your haq. And then what? You keep it moving. You mind your business if they don't want to accept it. Or if it turns into an argument. Or if they make fun of you. Or whatever the case may be. But it's still your family. Wallahu ta'ala alam. How do you deal with waswasa? I have done rukia so many times. But it doesn't help. Well, what I say, and I've been dealing with uh, Muslims who have with West, with West for a very long time, and that is the most commonly asked question, the most uh, frequent or frequently asked uh, or uh, issue, the thing that is most widespread, even more popular than marriage and divorce as an imam, and as someone who provides online counseling services. Via Zoom. And alhamdulillah, for anyone who needs those services or wants those services, you can find them on our websites, hadithdiscipleshop.com, which inshallah won't be canceled or abrogated for anything else. And uh, the convenience and ease of your own home, the comfort of your own home. You can have, inshallah, uh, Islamic therapy or counseling sessions, which are private and confidential. And out of all the time I've been asked in person as an imam, or called on the phone, or Zoom, let alone the COVID pandemic, in which the masjid was closed, or the masjids were closed, and people still needed those services. So alhamdulillah, we tried to provide them. You think that it's marriage, right? Divorce. A man and woman divorce, talaq, khulat, nope. Wiswas is number one. The waswasa is king. If 10 people book the Zoom with me, nine out of 10 of them will be asking about waswasa. So it's very widespread, unfortunately. And of course, there are different ways of combating waswas, preventing it, fighting it, uh, getting rid of it. And unfortunately, sometimes you may not be able to get rid of it. Allah has the power, but you don't have the power, methanin, how to control the waswas. I can't get rid of it. It's hard, but I can at least do what? Control it. Manage it. It's minimized. It's locked up. 
It's chained down. It's hungry. It's going to want to eat eventually. But right now, I have it locked up. I always say it is the mind that is the mind confusing the mind. Do not leave the mind to the mind, O oh mind. It is the mind that is the mind confusing the mind. Do not leave the mind to the mind, O oh mind. So how many minds are mentioned in these few lines of poetry? How many minds am I speaking on? Three minds. Anybody else? Four minds. Anybody else? Six. Anybody else? One. Anybody else? There are only two minds being spoken on. Two minds. Count with me. The lines and the time mind is mentioned. It is the mind that is the mind. That's only what? One mind. It's the akal, that's the akal, which is doing what? Confusing the, the mind, meaning the, the true mind. It's the false mind that is the mind confusing the true mind. It's the illusion. It's the stuff that doesn't exist that is disturbing the fitra. That's disturbing the qalb of the Muslim. That's disturbing the actual aql of the Muslim. So therefore, do not leave the mind, meaning don't leave the true mind at the mercy of the false, fake mind, O. Oh, speaking to the what mind? The true mind. Got it? It's the fake mind. That's the mind confusing the true mind. So therefore, don't leave the true mind to the fake mind, O oh, true mind. You get it or not? This may sound a little, you know, mystical or philosophical or some type of baltil, sufia, to so if someone's going to watch this, and what is he talking about? He's calling the people to misguidance and balala and rhetoric, ilm al kalam, kada, 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 kada. But just sit down and think about it. The first mistake that someone who suffers from wiswas, the first mistake that they make and the biggest mistake is that they validate the wiswas. They lend their ear to the wiswas. They give an audience to the Wiswas. And they don't realize that every single thing about the Wiswas or the Waswasa is what? Fake, phony. It doesn't exist. It isn't real. So why are you listening to it? Why are you giving time and attention to that fake whispering? An example of this. A brother contacts me and he says that when I go to the bathroom, I have a very hard time, which many people do. And there in the bathroom, he says, I have to spend an hour to make wudu, Muhammad. An hour, sa'a, just to perform wudu. Not to take a shower or bath, which is a long time, but just making wudu is an hour long. It's a fight. Did I wash my elbow? Did I say bismillah? Is the water clean? Do I have incontinence of urine? Can I? It's a fight. It's a struggle. So I said to the brother, I gave him advice, this, this, and that. He said, no, you don't understand, Sheikh. It's not that simple. It's not that easy. But what if, what if, I said, et cetera. So I asked him. I said, how long have you been Muslim? He said, such and such amount of years. What have you studied? What books have you read? Such and such. What fossils have you read? Such and such. How difficult is wudu? How long does wudu take? What mastery is needed to make a basic, fundamentally sound wudu? Obviously, we want to say what? Five minutes, two minutes. It doesn't take a lot for you to make a basic wudu. So you know for sure that the wudu is easy and simple, right? Did I do this? Did I do this? Did you not learn it? Did you not study it? Are you mentally insane? Is your mind there? Why are you giving the fake false mind any audience? When you yourself know that the wudu is extremely simple, you learned the wudu. You've been Muslim for all of these years. You've read and studied these books. So the first mistake, the first sin of the wiswas is listening to the wiswas. And not recognizing and not declaring this was the West West to be false. Don't leave the mind to the what? To the mind. Don't allow the akal that's supposed to be sound to the face baseless batal akal. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing as my elf. It doesn't exist. It's an illusion. And the same applies to divorce. Did I divorce my wife? I can't say the D word. I can't say the T word. But we argue. But it's fake. It's false. So that's the first step in combating this was, is to disrespect this was. You have to disrespect it. You don't exist. You're fake. You're an enemy. You, you, get out of here. 
You're not welcomed versus, oh, let me think about it. Maybe, I think so. It's possible that I didn't wash my arm. It's possible that I didn't wipe my private parts. It's possible that the water was not just, it's, 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 bottle, la. So that's my piece of advice. And of course, there are other pieces of advice and other teachings that we have spread in the videos. But just think about that poetry, Adelie. Think about those lines. It's the mind. He, he came late. He missed out on the what? On the Tesawuf, huh? He didn't, he missed out on the, uh, the, the, uh, the, <laughs> he's from the commoners. He's not from the Arifin. Yeah? Along with the, uh, you guys get the point I'm trying to make? Whether you agree or not. You get the point? You, you, you have experienced people or yourself with Waswas? The first thing is listening to the fire dragon. Giving it an audience. Making it seem important. Wallahu alam. Don't worry, guys. Well, I don't want to say this on the live stream. Maybe after the live stream. Fadda. Anyone else? Go ahead, Bilal. How would was, you, that, was that all the sister's question? Yeah. How would you advise someone who has was was about getting married, thinking that they're not good enough to ever please a woman or ever be... Like... Clear. That's, and, and that's, and that's a, a good point with regards to the book. Is that West West, a big part of West West is fire dragon. That your own self is attacking you, killing you from within, doubting yourself from within. That's a problem. Well, I mean, reality, you're not good enough to get married. You're not handsome enough. You're not strong enough. You're not wealthy enough. You can't please women, et cetera. That, that doesn't make any sense. All right. I'm, I'm not the most handsome man. It's a fact. I don't have the most muscles. I'm not the smoothest ladies man like some brothers may be. Mashallah, you know? <laughs> Should we put the camera on them, Shake? <laughs> Definitely, right? Uh, uh, too bad we don't have a Zoom when this, when this live stream. So I'm not the Don Juan of women. I'm not, I don't have the greatest confidence to get any. I, I'm, not, I'm not that guy. I may be too this, I may be too that, or maybe I'm not the best looking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's a fact. But it's also a fact is that there are hundreds, if not thousands of men that may not have half of what I have. They may be far off, far worse than I am. They have mar they, they're married. They have children. Or just the concept of man and woman. Look at this guy. You say, how did he land that? Look at the girl he has with him. It's a reality. Let's keep it real. Let's be honest. People, they say this all the time. How did he what? It's real or vice versa. So you can, it, there's always someone that's in your eyes or their eyes that's worse off or better off. That's the point I'm trying to get. And the Prophet Wasallam, he sums this up beautifully. Do not look at those who are above you, but look at those who are beneath you. And that allows you to appreciate Allah's ni'mah. I feel that I'm ugly. I feel I'm too skinny. I feel I'm too this. I feel I'm too that. Where there are people who don't have, they have, he has a missing arm. This person who has this type of scar, well, heck, there's always something that's, that's challenged more. So why listen to the wish wise and ignore the reality? Let alone the fact that if you were so hideous and this and that, people wouldn't sit with you. They wouldn't talk with you. They wouldn't come near you. So that's that self-doubt, that lack of self-esteem, thinking that I can't get married, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that, I can't be. That's all from the shelter. And that's all from the fake nuts, the false mind that is confusing. What's the job? I, the, the false mind, his job is to do what? It's to cloud, to confuse, to attack, to strangle the clear mind, which is based off of facts. And that is beauty in, is in the eyes of the beholder. That's a fact. And love is blind. It's also a what? La shek. Huh? You have more life experience. You agree with that, Saeed? It's a fact. Wallahu alam. Wayakum. May Allah make it easy for all the young brothers and sisters who aren't married and, and prevent them from being, yani, <laughs> I can't say, yani, may Allah protect them all. Allahumma ameen. Fadr ya akhi. I'm sorry? Inshallah. Uh, regarding Salat and Jumu'ah, uh, what is the like, minimum amount of people that can be in the congregation? Jumu'ah? No. The strongest view is that the requirement of Jumu'ah is the requirement of Jama'ah. 
The smallest, lowest number for Jama'ah is that for Jumu'ah. That's the correct view. Of course, it's, it's the safest thing to do is to have at least three people. The safest thing I said. Safest thing. One who makes the uh, adhan, iqama, the imam, and another brother sitting. That's the safest thing to do. But Jama'ah is two. And also Jumu'ah will be two, according to the Qul Rajah. As far as 40, 70, 300, so on and so forth, those other views, that's a different story. Allah alam. Wa iyakum, wa fikum. Khayyir, inshallah. Hassan. Yes, thank you so much. Alright, salam Understood. Well, from the signs of personality worship is you discard your mind. You stop thinking. From the signs of personality worship, and this is reality, we're going to say it, is you, you ain't getting anything. What is he really saying? Huh, Abu Sayyid? What, what beneficial knowledge is being put out there? You sit somebody, you sit with them for a whole hour, and you came out, what... One hadith, one one fact, a week. How long you been traveling? What did, what did you really get? What did he quote? What did he? What is he teaching? For real, for real, you're not getting anything. What worldly power or status are you getting from it? You just tag along. You just worshiping that person's personality. Every now and then they make a joke. Every now and then they say this, and don't ever forget a skilled charlatan, a skilled imper in person, a, a, a imposter, impersonator, and one who's skilled. He knows how to pepper and lace. Every now and then, get him a little, you know, hadith. Every now and then, mention an ayah. Every now and then, Imam Ahmed said such and such. But the 60 minutes, the hour, two hours, the lifetime, for real, for us, is faulty. It's just a bunch of kalam, yani. It's, no, it's, none, it's nothing real. But you still attach to that person. Blindly loyalty. Bl a blindly loyal, fanatical. That's a sign that you do what? You worship that person's person. You hero worship them. That you're, that's your idol, your icon. And your attachment to this person isn't based off of the knowledge. No doubt, I'm loyal to, uh, 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 I'm loyal to you, Notre Dame. Oh, whenever we say something about Notre Dame, you get mad. You def that's right. Because Notre Dame is feeding me. I've benefited. I've learned. He's, he's giving me in. You, yeah, you, we would say in America, you such and such skippy. You, you darn right, I'm going to defend them. You darn right, I'm going to travel with them. Why are you always traveling with them? Why are you always, yeah, I'm supposed to be loyal to them. I am going to defend them because he does what? He's given me ilm nafir. He's benefited my soul by Allah's permission. He's taught me countless things. He shared with me that he didn't have to versus the person that you're blindly following, you're stuck to, who gives you what? Measly crumbs. That they can't even pronounce or read or recite correctly. Because of what? Personality worship. Everyone understand this? And there are other signs as well. Respecting your teacher, loving your teacher, being loyal to your teacher, that doesn't mean personality worship. And of course, there's always going to be vague lines in the middle. Bravery versus foolishness. That's a fact. You're reckless or brave. That's, that's, that's always going to be subjective. Generous versus you're irresponsible with money. Wise versus you're coward. I'm wise. I'm smart. Or are you actually scared? So that's always going to be what? Subjective. So one person will say your loyalty to your teacher, your respect, your love, your service, oh, your personality worshiping. You just, and another, so it's always going to be from person to person. Ma'ul wala. Ma'ul wala. Alhamdulillah. Khair, any other questions? Father Abdul Malik. Thanks for the tea, too. How do you know when you have an issue with your spouse that it's time to break apart? Time to break apart? Understood. Well, just because you had therapy or mean it was the right therapy or the right counseling. Just like a doctor. I went to the doctor five times. I had surgery. It wasn't the right surgery. 
wasn't the right doctor. When doctor cuts you open, boom, stitches you back together, like new. And another doctor, three, four, five times, he puts you under the knife, the surgeon, and it still hurts. Doesn't mean that it's, it can't be fixed, but the surgery may be the wrong surgery, the wrong therapy, the wrong prescription, etc. So you gotta diversify who counsels you. Somebody else may give you some better advice or what heck of that. That's number one. Number two, butting heads with your wife, fighting with your wife. That isn't an absolute must for divorce. It doesn't mean that just because you clash with your wife, you divorce and you separate. Sometimes clashing with your wife is a good thing. Sometimes. You argue because of you're both passionate about the truth or because I love you. That's why I'm arguing with you. And if I didn't love you and if I didn't want to be with you, salam, class. Versus I'm upset, I'm mad, I'm jealous because I what? I was. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. Now how often you butt heads, how intense the fight gets, what's said, people who are angry oftentimes speak the truth, etc., etc. That's a different story. But just because you have a disagreement with your wife often, that doesn't mean that you should get a divorce. Well, I know people, couples, you see them argue, man. Am I making this up, Shake? Cats and dogs. Rah, rah, rah. All the time fighting. They fight over the smallest, simplest things. But they love each other to the core. But it doesn't mean it's healthy. And it doesn't mean that it isn't toxic. What's important is, is that you need to make sure that you're getting the right counseling. And you need to control yourself before you think about your wife. How much of the sunnah are you implementing? You get angry. You have bad temper. You have big ego. You can't be wrong. You can't take a loss in an argument. You always have to be right. You're controlling. You're extremely insecure. Jealous wreck. It's a problem. And there are many, many other evils, bloodsuckers, parasites in a marriage that sap the energy, the positive energy, and turn it into an argument and a fight. As far as if all of these things, whatever you say, look, then if it's time to go, then what? It's time to go. We aren't Christians. Divorce isn't impermissible in our religion. And the scholars of Islam, many of them say, not all of them, but many of them, they say that sometimes divorce is applied to the five rulings of Islam. There are times in which divorce is mandatory. It has to be done. And there are times in which divorce is recommended. It should, you shouldn't do it, yachi. And then there are times in which it's haram to divorce. So it depends on the situation. Wallahu alam. We have a question from the back. Nam, Bismillah. Yes, yes, tafaltani. It's an hour to Allah because. Khair, inshallah. Do's and don'ts with your teacher. Friendly, too friendly, first name, etc., etc., etc. This is applicable to other aspects of life. Someone who's older than you, like really older than you, it's best not to address them by their first name. Brother, Sheikh, many cultures, Am, you know, they always say Saab at the end, Mufti Saab, Fulan, you know, Baji, this and that. Honorific, respectful title. Honorific or respectful title, right? Am I making this up? Many cultures, they have this. <coughs> All right, yirhamakillah, or yirhamakallah, right? Um, nicknames are always a, a means of affection. Calling somebody by their nickname, someone who's close to you. They don't, they, you know, don't call you by your government name or your real you know, nickname. They know you, it's affection. You know, by their kunya, Abu Abdurrahman, Um Abdurrahman, wahakada. As far as your spouse, <laughs> that depends on you, huh? Would you want to call your spouse and what? Would you want your spouse to call you? As long as it isn't haram, the door is open. What's important is balance. You have to remain balanced. You can't go extreme in which your teacher is just a teacher and then that's it. It's very hard for a human being to benefit from someone and not to... Uh, develop affection to that person. It's almost impossible. 
Rather, the ulama of Islam, they say, Al-Nufusu Majbulatun Ala Men or Majbulatun Ala Hubi Men Ahsana Ilayha. That the soul is naturally inclined, connected, attached to those who do good and treat it well. That's, that's a fact. So this is your teacher, you learn from this person, it's only but a matter of time before you what? There's some closeness and that professional line is going to be jumped, it's going to be breached. It's a fact. And the Prophet ﷺ, he smiled. The Prophet ﷺ, some narrations mention Bahik, he laughed, whether you translate as laugh or smile. Al Wim, they saw his teeth. Hata, Yani, they saw his, you could see his teeth, right? The Messenger of Allah said, was a companion who used to make jokes in front of the Prophet. He used to make, make jokes in front of the Prophet. So, your teacher, it doesn't mean you have to be a robot with them. It doesn't mean that you don't have no feeling, no emotion, but it means that you know the balance and you know when to turn it on, when to turn it off, and based off of the teacher. Teacher who's friendly, who's open, who doesn't mind, and some teachers are very sensitive and very strict. You blink or shake your head the wrong way, they'll take that as disrespect. You talk back, you doubt, khalas. And there are other teachers who don't mind, tafadda, what you got? La, da, 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 you go back and forth. It depends on the teacher. What's important is you show respect, and inshallah, respect will be shown to you. What's important is you follow the rules, and you know when not to follow the rules. That's a fact. The times in which the rules... You, it's the, 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 the lines you cross them certain, certain times so it depends and what's important is is you try your best to show those people whom Allah has given virtue of you the utmost respect especially the virtue of knowledge but that doesn't mean worshipping them it doesn't mean kissing up and sucking up and boot licking it doesn't mean turning a blind eye to clear falsehood it doesn't mean making weak excuses, huh? Abu Sayyid, apologies oh, for clear khata. Nothing is she had. We're talking about clear wrong. La, that's a different story. Wallahu alam. Wa yakum. Adnan. Aren't you saying in a lecture that we should stick to formulas and. Learn the formulas. No, learn the, learn the form, but seek the formulas. Learn the form, but seek the formless. Taib. This means you learn the rules, the qawaid, the proofs and the evidences, the things, not even the proofs and evidences, because that's different. Because the proofs and evidences always have different understandings and interpretations. But we're talking about things that are that are solid, concrete rules, how to study. How to teach, how to read, stuff that isn't open for interpretation. But while you learn those rules, it should be, that's what I say, but it should be your intention, your goal, your aspiration to seek that which is formless. Because this thing here won't work here. This thing there won't work over there. So you always have to have the ability to bend and twist and shave and round. This is the square, this is the, you have to put things in different places, different times. 2022 in London. Everything that you do in uh, uh, Calcutta, you did it in Calcutta 100 years ago, 200 years ago, it's not going to work in London in 2022. But it doesn't mean that you compromise on the hardcore values, the form, which can never, ever be changed. There's no itch to had in this issue. There is no new interpretation of this. La. There is no in in science and technology ever then. And there are other things in which there lies no doubt that because of technology, that because of uh, this, that because of that, because of the situation of the Muslims, it has what? Changed and it needs to be revamped, reformed, recalibrated to fit properly. Understand? And that also another meaning of that statement and another interpretation of that statement, learn the form but seek the form this, is making your own style. I learned the, the rules from my teacher. If I wanted to, I could just copy my teacher's formula, if I wanted to, which has been proven to be successful. But at the same time, I should also add my little seasonings. You know, this is, you know, I'm a chef. My, 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 um, my, my head chef, my teacher, this is how he would present a steak. And then I said, I'm gonna cut it up 
and you know, wrap it and twirl it and like that and present it on a plate. What's the difference? The same steak, same flavor, same this. He uses sea salt. I prefer to use this type of salt. Whack it out. Learn the form, but what? Seek the formless. Wallahu alam. Khair, any other questions? Why did I choose Hadith? There are many reasons behind that. Um, I've explained those reasons. And I'll tell you now, I, I sought Hadith because, um, first and foremost, Allah's blessing. That's first and foremost. Guidance from Allah. Secondly, it was that when I was your age, how old are you? Ten. Ten. When I was your age, I loved history. I was fascinated with history and geography. And when I started studying Islam and learning Arabic and I started memorizing the Quran, I realized that a big part of Hadith was history and geography. Kufa, Basra, Baghdad, Wasit, Mosul, right? Al Jazeera, Al Maghrib, Al Mashriq. You understand? Dates, times, and places. That's, that's the vertebrae of Hadith, right? So my secular passions. Walked right into the religious spiritual passions. And, and that's a very important lesson, guys. A very important lesson is that you don't always have to change yourself. And oftentimes you shouldn't try to change yourself. And oftentimes you can't change yourself. Sometimes you can, sometimes you must. But sometimes you just go with the flow. The Prophet ﷺ says that the best of you in Jahiliya are the best of you. In Islam, with conditions that you learn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, if you can keep your same likes and hobbies and passions in light of the deen, why not? So that, that, that's what led me to it. Thirdly is, I was always attracted to strength and power. And I saw that hadith dominated and monopolized strength and power. And that's what I wanted to go after. Wallahu alam. Uh, so going on the Bobby question, uh, when you mentioned about uh, Ahkam and Hikmah, um, what's the difference between um, Bulugh al Maram and Al Muharrar? Right, Bulugh al Maram and Al Muharrar. What are the differences? Well, first and foremost, you have to understand the parallels. They're both hadith compilations, they aren't original masadir, they are marajia. Bulugh al Maram, Muharrar, they aren't books in which the author gives his isnad to the actual sahabi. His isnad to the actual mukharraj. But he says, وَعَنْ أَبِي هُرَيْرَ وَعَنْ عَمْرِ بِنْ شُعَيْبٍ عَنْ نَبِيهِ عَنْ جَدِّهِ وَعَنْ فُلَانِ مِنْ فُلَانِ فُلَانِ عَنْ نَبِيهِ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ That's it. So this is an original master. حَدَّثَنَا أَخْبَرَنَا etc. Secondly, the, the, the second thing that Bulugh al-Muram and Muharrar share is that they are initially geared towards a hadith al-ahkam. The hadith on halal and haram, even though there are chapters that deal with spirituality in both books. Kitab al-Jami'ah. There, there are hadiths on good character, on the etiquette of Islam, on zuhud, on taqwa, on softness of the heart. Thirdly, is that these books are relatively late books. 8th century, 9th century, etc. Versus 5th century, 4th century, what that, right? Another parallel or consistency between the two books is that both books are studied and memorized and taught globally. What that? As far as some of the differences, then obviously Ibn Abdul Hadi, rahimahullah ta'ala, came before Ibn Hajar. He's, he's, he's earlier than Ibn Hajar. Secondly, Obviously, Ibn Abdul Hadi was Hanbali. Ibn Hajar was Shafi'i. Thirdly, Al Muharrar has a bit more meat and juice to it. It gives more of the isnad, of the ilm, of the ikhtilafat, etc., etc. And Bulugh Muram gives the takhrij, gives very, very yani, mukhtasar, summarized commentary on the ilm, but it's far more lean. It's far more lean. Muharrar is the chicken breast, as it is. And Bulugh al Maram is skinless, boneless. Skinless, boneless. No bone, no skin. And Muharrar is the whole entire breast of the chicken. The bone, the skin, the tendon, kulushay. Right? With a little bit of trimming. 
Muharram, Bulug al-Maram is lean. Nothing extra, nothing too more. Bang, just what you need. Wagada. And obviously the length of the book, one being longer than the other, right? And there are also some differences with regards to the tartib, with regards to the arrangement of the chapters. And that goes back to the difference of their, their madhahib. That's in brief. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Khair inshallah. That's everything. Fadr akhi. What's the best way to evaluate yourself daily before you go to sleep? Think about your day. Think about what you did. Think about if you die. What did you accomplish? What did you fail at? Where did you fail at? What happened there? Evaluate yourself on a daily basis. And also, you need to do a weekly evaluation, monthly, then yearly, etc. Another important uh, way of, of evaluating yourself is sometimes you have to compare yourself to others, but not all the time. And that's a capital mistake. And it's a big trick of shaitan. It's getting you to constantly look at other men, other women. What you should have, what you should be, what I could have, etc. Sometimes that's useful, but that's limited. Right? Also, you have to ask yourself, what have I done with my opportunities? Dang. SubhanAllah. I actually went overseas. Arabic was easy for me. So on and so forth. I had access to study things that other brothers, my age, my race, from my city, from my town, never had access to. What did I do with it? If he had what I had, he would have been there. I'm still right here. So you look at your at the accessible opportunities and what you have done with them. And the law knows best. Any other questions from the brothers or the sisters? Go ahead, Akhi. Understood. How do you balance between spending time with your wife and your family, going to the masjid, so on and so forth? Khairan. I would say, first and foremost, you have to understand how to kill two birds with one stone. Or that may be politically incorrect in 2022. Or, you know, the movement for plant-based foods. And so we say how to... How to... Uh, nah, you can't harm trees either. Uh, how to... Um, I don't know how to how to eat two veggie patties at once. <laughs> Methanin. You guys get the point I'm trying to make. Is it like that here in the UK? Ah, beef eaters, eh? Well, huh? Yeah, beef eaters, isn't it? Huh? Hey, it's Canada. And America is big. It's a big movement. All major brands, major companies, all major uh, restaurants, coffee shops, plant based, plant based. They do that here as well, then. Okay, but well, that's what I'm asking about. Yeah, they're pushing it. Yeah, leather seats and the cars. It says it's, it's not from animals. You know, vegan. It's, 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 it's a push. So how do you eat two veggie patties at the same time? Make family time by taking your wife to the masjid with you. Let's go to the masjid together. Now with the, bro the brothers hanging out with your wife. I'm going to hold your hand. You're going to go to the masjid. Afterwards, we're going to have dinner, we're going to have a coffee together, we're going to take a romantic walk coming or two from the masjid. So you spend time with your wife, but at the same time, you have to do, come on, that way he says, focus, yeah, uh, He's basically saying he wants the tour to finish, so. Allahu Akbar. SubhanAllah. You have to learn how to involve your wife in your search of knowledge, in your spirituality. Share with your wife what you learned. Tell her how, how, much you, how much you love knowledge, how it makes you feel, what it does for you. As your friend, you're my best friend. I love you, and I want to share the most valuable thing to me, this book that I got, this class. That, why get that? You involve her, you include her. Get her to study as well. Last but not least, no matter how smooth you try to be, let's keep it real, let's be honest. Even if you have to be politically correct, a woman is going to complain. It's a fact. No matter how much time you spend, you don't study, you don't travel, you only have one wife, a woman is going to complain about time. And a man who goes home to the same wife every night, he never travels, he never goes on vacation, I guarantee if you interviewed his wife, she would find a way to say that he doesn't give me enough time. Raise your hand if you agree or disagree with this. 
And no sisters agree, of course. They're not keeping it real. They know they're not being honest with themselves. You can spend all day, every day, go home, work. She'll find a way. I wish I could have more time with you. I wish I could be with you more. I wish, I wish. That's a fast, that's nature. So therefore, if you are devoted to your studies, you try to spend time with your wife, you try to be kind, you try, but at the same time, look, I'm sorry. That's how it is. You married me. You knew my lifestyle. Can't, that's all, it's the best I can do. Me divorce my knowledge, divorce the time, nah, I'm sorry. And obviously, most of us, we don't have enough, you know, courage to do that or to say that, but that's how it is. It's, it's, it's that simple. We'll make a balance, inshallah. If you're reasonable, hopefully your wife will be reasonable. If your family is reasonable, they'll be reasonable. And, and the, the biggest piece of advice, all jokes aside, is that you have to make it clear to the people your utter love and devotion to knowledge. The more that they know that your love and devotion to knowledge is unshakable, it's not but so much they're going to attack you and come at you because they know it's a waste of time. As far as if you yourself are flimsy and floppy, you're really not, you're really not that devoted, then it's a different story. Wallahu alam. Any other questions? Hudayfa. Naam? Fadl. Understood. Tight. Tight. inshallah. Nah, why you watch yourself, Abu Hamza? Tight. How to include reading in your lifestyle, your life, and do you read from other sources other than Islamic sources, etc.? The sad reality is many of us aren't natural readers. Many of us don't like to read, unfortunately. And alhamdulillah, there are brothers and sisters who do like to read, who love to read, who are bookworms, living in the book. Biting holes through the page. That's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's a blessing of Allah upon me that I'm thankful for is that I always loved reading the books even before Hadith Disciple. Alhamdulillah. And like I said, when I started learning, the transition was smooth. I didn't have to fight myself to be studious. That's a blessing of Allah. So therefore, I never liked reading. I accepted Islam. I was raised Muslim, but I never... What, what can I do now? You have to learn how to build momentum, how to build rhythm. It's like starting a fire with a match or a lighter or rocks. You're out in the woods. All you need to start a fire is what? Little small spark. But you have to work for that spark. You have to blow it. You have to, you have to protect it from the wind. And then you put it on the wood or the paper. So you have to find something that catches your interest. It can be sports. Let's say, for example, it can be politics or money. I like making money. So every now and then I read an article or a magazine about economics and finance. That's a step versus I just watch it or listen to it, right? And then be the night, Tyler, you feed that, 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 that. You have to give it a shot. Reading feels good. No matter how good it is to watch something or listen to something, it's nothing like a good read. That's a fact. But you'll never know that unless you expose yourself to it. And you have to give it a shot, give it a chance. So I would advise you to find something that interests you, even if it is un-Islamic. Not against Islam, of course, but I'm talking about it's just something secular. Soccer, football, we call it soccer, you guys call it football. Uh, you know, politics, whatever it is. Something that's just, inshallah, mubah. There's no ruling attached to it. I like cars. So I'm going to read about cars. And then be the night, Tyler, you allow it to grow and to flourish. Secondly, you have to realize the necessity of reading. Even if you hate it, the bitter medicine is the means of healing you. Medicine tastes horrible, but you need it to get well. The needle is going to hurt, but you got to take it. This is no way you got to train yourself. Bismillah. I have to do it. I have to read. You have to fight yourself. And Allah tells us, is that when you fight yourself for the sake of Allah, Allah guides you. We will make it easy for him. Allah says what? Those who do what? Who give in his cause and have taqwa. What will Allah do? Allah will make it easy for you. And there are many other verses as well. Allah will make it easy for you. But you have to fight in the beginning. You have to take the bitter medicine. It's going, you must taste bitter before sweet. That's another dojo qaida. 
you must taste bitter before sweet. And inshallah ta'ala, you hang around people who like to read books. Not people who make fun of you, laugh at you, mock you, jest at you. Ah, he's reading a book. Ah, here comes the librarian. Save it for the library, bro. It's a reality. Many people, they're like this. And where I come from, unfortunately, I don't know how it is here, but where I come from, I'm sure a couple other American brothers here you can uh, attest to, in general, it's not, it's not a cool thing to, to read books. Everyone makes fun of, uh, you know, he's a nerd, he's a this, he's a that, he's this, he's wacky. He, they make fun of him. And that in itself is just total stupidity. The cool one in high school, the hip one in high school, the jock in high school, the ladies man in high school, the this in high school, in most cases when they graduate, what, what, how do they turn out? Strung out on drugs, poor, in jail, this and not everybody, but I'm talking about in most cases. And the nerd, the one that was picked on, they made fun of, they beat up, that's the one that owns half the block now, the real estate. That's the one who made this division. That's the, this uh, entertain, whatever the case may be. It's, that's how things are. Let alone the fact that, you know, the shoes that you wear, the clothes that you wear, the phone that you have, the movies that you listen to, uh, watch, the, the, the music that you listen to, all that stuff was made by a what? Some guy with thick glasses. Some introvert, weird, nerdy, corny, ugly looking type of lady. That's the one who designed that. That's the one who made that, that you're benefiting from. So it don't make any sense to make fun of people like that. Let alone the fact that, and this is also a big problem for where I come from, is that people, they look down upon book knowledge, they look down upon studies, unless it benefits them. If you can help them cheat on a test, if it helps them with their illegal activities, then they'll clearly bring in someone who's smart and someone who's a, book, a bookworm. That's a problem. So you can't hang around people like that. You got to hang around people who think that it's cool and fun and hip to read books. And the more books you got, the cooler you are. The more you read, the cooler you are. That's, that's the, your circle. You got to be around people, birds of a feather, they do what? You never see a falcon or an owl with a pigeon hanging out. Hey, what's up? You won't see that. You won't see a vulture and a sparrow getting along. They don't have to. Be birds of prey, they're with what? They're either by themselves or what? Other birds of prey. Wolves don't hang out with jackals. They don't get along because they're two different things. Your lifestyle, the lifestyle of the wolf, is not the lifestyle of the hare. This thing eats plants, runs, jumps, and hops, and this one eats other animals and hunts them. It's a difference. So you have to be around people that respect reading, that like reading, and most importantly, you have to train yourself, you have to start slow, you have to gain interest, and you have to always make dua. As far as do you read books other than Islamic books, then of course, there's no question about that. Wallahu alam. In the back. Um, Understood. It's something that you're doing wrong. Something's off. You have right now, and in most cases, in Lano's best, you have like four or five extension cords. And, you know, a power source and a, a device. Somewhere down the line, one of those cords has a short in it. A rip, a tear, something's off. It's not enough juice. Something's off. For the same thing to keep happening... And for it to become worse and more difficult, this is that something's off in your system. I'm here. I'm trying to get there. The same thing keeps going. Something's off in the middle. Like I said about the marriage counseling, just because you keep doing it doesn't mean you're doing it the right way. And one of the ways of discovering what's right and what's wrong is to diversify. You got to mix it up. I tried this way. It didn't work. So let me try another way. I tried this person. It wasn't helpful. It only made it worse. Let me try someone else. I tried this book. Well, let me watch it. I tried to watch it. Let me listen to it. So you got to learn how to diversify your approach 
if the same thing keeps happening, let alone becomes worse. Somewhere down the line, something's off. You have a broken phone, a malfunctioning computer. What's the first thing to tell you? It's to troubleshoot. Make sure this is plugged in properly. Make sure this is switched on. Make sure this is such and such. Make sure this is green. And in most cases, somewhere down the line, it's a switch. It's something that's not fully put in that's causing the glitch or the shortage. So you propose to rewind back? No doubt. Reevaluate and double check every step. Make sure it's done properly. Seek the guidance of the counsel of someone. Tell them your formula. Tell them your system. Every time I, I make tea at home, it doesn't turn out like your tea. Shake, blah, 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 blah. I don't have no magic hand, no magical hand, but it's something that you're doing wrong. The water, the leaves, the sweetener. So you have to tell your tea preparation, your tea recipe to the person, step by step. Am, am I doing this right? Did I do this right? Am I understanding this right? Because you may think that something's going wrong and it's going well. You may think something's a punishment, it could be a blessing. You may think something's a blessing, it could be a what? Punishment, a trial. What? What happened? That? That's what I was saying. Sure. Understood. If a sister wants to make hijra and there's no one to accompany her mahram and she feels that she has to make hijra or she really should, whether it's durura or haja, then let her travel without the mahram. Even without like, that? Yeah, then go. That's what I would say. Wallahu alam. I mean, zakam al khairan. Adawi, al Adawi. Mu'arrafan. Al Adawi. Tfadda. Crystal clear. Weaknesses and strengths is those relative, relative terms. Let alone the fact that oftentimes there's a prejudice behind the usage of the word weakness or strength. You think you're weak, but have you really checked the chords in between? Did you study it properly? Did you take the necessary steps? How many times did you do it? How many times did you attempt for you to declare it's a weakness of mine's? Convenience. Because it was a little challenging in the beginning, I say, I'm not that strong in this. It's a, you're really not weak in it, but you're just scared to really apply yourself. So you don't know which castle you can and cannot conquer until you lay siege to it. You did it properly. You followed the necessary steps. They resisted the siege, etc., etc. Then you say this one is a little difficult. Let alone leave that castle. That's 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 a bit too much. But you never know until you take your catapults and you well, hack it there. You don't know until you make a sincere, concentrated effort at tackling the thing. Once you've done that properly, more than once. With the help of Allah, first and foremost, taking the correct steps, and you find it difficult or impossible, then you can say, it's not my strength. You never know what is meant for you until you make an attempt at it. And of course, there, there are times in which, for sure, you know, I'm not that strong at that. That's fine. This isn't my strength. I am good at this. But you have to make an attempt. That's the point I'm trying to make. So if you're young, you don't know until you push yourself, until you apply yourself, Right? Secondly is, is learn what's necessary in this field in which you're a little weak. That's fine. As long as you have the basics. As long as you understand what you need to understand. And as long as you know when to say, I don't know, this is from my weakness, you got to ask someone else. You get, what I'm, you get what I'm trying to say? As far as you, you love a thing, but you feel that you're going to be weak at it. Or you're not going to be that strong at it. Go with your heart every time. Go with your heart. And inshallah ta'ala with sincerity and the hard work and the consistency, 
you'll find a chink in the armor of that difficulty. You'll find a way to get in if you really love it. That's my nasiha when it comes to seeking knowledge. Wallahu alam. Wayakum. Question is coming from Samir Musallim, Medina, Saudi Arabia. You sure it's not uh, uh, Toronto, Ontario? Samir Musallim from South, from Medina. Who's that? Huh? Disciple X. <laughs> I know a Samir Musallim from Toronto. From Saudi Arabia, Medina, the prophet city. Allahu Alam. Who's that? Huh? It says for a non specialist of the field of hadith, which hadith compilation will be a good solid book for them to memorize and keep as a foundation for themselves? Barakallahu Fikum, Hayakum Allah. I would say, no doubt, Bulug Maram. It's excellent. And Bulug Maram isn't exclusive to hadith specialists. People of other fields, other genres, and other disciplines, they should study the book and memorize the book as well. La shak fi dalik. Bulug Maram is excellent work. Bi ghayr al-mutakhassis. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Khayr inshallah. Any other questions, brothers and sisters? Go ahead, Akhi. What are some of the differences that you've seen between the da'wah in the UK and the US? Differences between the Dawah in the U.S. and the U.K.? Uh, I would say numbers, the lies, no doubt. It's more here. It's a fact. I would also say hunger. It's my fourth trip to the U.K., so I think I, I have the right to give an opinion. What you say, Abu Isa? Many of you, they give their opinion without even visiting the country. They give a ruling. It's a fact on the on the people or the culture. Let alone it came, you know, this is my fourth trip here. So I think I can formulate a pain. I think I'm not saying there are trust me, I've many students in America and Canada that are hungry. But if I'm talking about ratio, number, volume, quantity, there's a lot of hunger and a lot of hungry people here in the UK. Walhamdulillah. And we respect that. You know, real, recognize real, as they say. The energy that you bring me is what? The energy that you'll give back for brothers and sisters. We respect that. And I remember when I was in Khalid Hadith, one of my main teachers that I was fortunate enough to have taught me more than once, the same book but in a different semester, different level, he was known to be from the hardest and most difficult of teachers. Students would make dua against them. Wallahi, after the exam, they would, they would make dua against him. They felt that he had wronged them. And alhamdulillah, I never made dua against this teacher. I never fought with him. I loved him. He was hard. Don't get it twisted. I'm not going to lie to you, make it a romantic story. It was, it was challenging. But I never disliked it or hated him. And I started appreciating him the more that I grew and matured in my studies. And the closer that I got to graduating, the more I loved the teacher, let alone after graduation. So I remember once... We were sitting around in the hallway in Kulit al-Hadith, and we were waiting to take the exam for the master's program, the first exam. So the brothers, they were sitting around, and they were talking about some of their teachers. And this teacher, he had a brother. And they said, oh, that's Sheikh Fulan's brother, blah, 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 blah. Cool, no problem. So one brother in my class, he was like, yeah, you remember Dr. Fulan? Remember Mustawal Awal? Remember how crazy that was? Dang, remember when he taught us the second time? Remember, the, how, remember that? MashaAllah, we about to graduate trying to get into the master's program. So I remember this one brother, a friend of mine from Egypt, he said, defending the sheikh, he said, the sheikh is a hardliner. That's a fact. He's, he's, he's no joke. But, يُقَدِّرُهُ He says that when a student of knowledge comes to him, he respects that student of knowledge. Meaning, from the reasons why this sheikh is so hard is because he's fed up and he's frustrated with weak, fake, feeble students. And when he sees a real student reminiscent of the old days with the respect, with the hunger, with the diligence, with the talent, with the sacrifice, he gives him full respect. So the point is, is that when you see someone that's young, that's hungry, that's not coming with a bunch of fitna interrogating you, 
but then telling you, but I'm not interrogating you. I want to ask you what you said. Is it true? What did you mean? I'm not interrogating you, but in reality, it is an interrogation. I'm not trying to, you know, when you see someone that has the necessary respect, that's, that's hungry. It reminds you of yourself. And alhamdulillah, I can say from my trips in the UK, just like Canada and other countries, America, I've seen, well, alhamdulillah, I'm seeing as I speak many, many, many young brothers and sisters with that hunger, with that passion. Alhamdulillah. And that's something that we respect. And that's something that we value. And if we didn't respect that, if we didn't value that, well, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be losing sleep with my eyes half closed. It's not bragging. I'm being realistic. Bags, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, we wouldn't be here today. We would be home, comfy, comfortable, somewhere else. We wouldn't be here. But Allah had hummed. So that's something that we respect. So, so from the things that I've seen in the UK is that there's a lot of hunger, a lot of young brothers and young sisters, no discrimination. Inshallah, that wouldn't be real, true disciples. And that, that's something that's in, you found in other countries too, but it's, it's a lot here. So that's probably one of the differences. One of the differences between here and there is, man, that's enough. <laughs> that answer can become quite momentous. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. Are there any other questions? If not, we'll stop. Any other questions? Abdul Malik, tafadda. قلنا أسئلة يا أخي أما الردود والاعتراضات والطعونات قلنا أسئلة واحد يسأل يستفيد ينتفع لا يصححك وأنت أخطأت وقلت كيت وكيت 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 لا عرفت فرق هناك سؤال وهناك اعتراض ولا لا تفضل عبد الملك three qualities top three from the Prophet Sallallahu That's difficult. The Prophet Sallallahu has so many beautiful qualities. Alayhi salatu wasalam. The man that we love more than ourselves. That we have to love more than ourselves. Alayhi salatu wasalam. His top three qualities. Hmm. Selflessness. He was selfless. Number two. He was generous. Without no limit. Number three, courage, fearless. Wallahu alam. Fadl. Why yak? Al firq. Al thalath. What's the what's the name of firq? Ah. The 73 sex. Khayran. Khayran. That's an excellent question. And it's very beneficial for each and every one of us. Bell. Rather, this question is needed for people that have been Muslim their entire lives. How do they navigate through all of the calls and the callers and the drama? And everyone trying to monopolize the haq to themselves exclusively. We're upon the truth and no one else is. And I think that we should just look at that claim. How is it even possible for everyone who have 50 different ways, styles, cliques, gangs, bands, masters, and all of them are saying the same thing? Somebody is lying. Somebody's exaggerating. Someone's hiding something. There's no way everyone can be telling the truth and there's no way that everyone's honest. We're not talking about different issues, discrepancies. We're talking about one says the sky is blue and another says rather the sky is scarlet red. It's not it's blue, which shade of blue, king blue, sky blue, red and blue. Somebody's off somewhere. Someone ain't telling the truth. Someone isn't being honest. So you have to know that. That's first and foremost. And sincerity is extremely important. And some of the ulama of Islam, they say that when it comes to da'wah, sincerity is the filter or the sifter. If there are 10 groups screaming, or 10 people, 10 individuals screaming and hollering, haq, 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 sunnah, ah, hardcore, smash mouth, wear upon the truth, they're innovators, etc., etc. Out of those 10 screamers, Who's really sincere from among them? 
who's knowledgeable and learned. And those sifters, the ikhlas and also ilm, which I forgot to mention, is going to sift through. Those seven people screaming, please wait outside the room. Jazakallah khairan. And that leaves just three brothers, three masjids, three imams, three scholars that actually have the qualifications. And inshallah ta'ala, the ikhlas is shown in their actions that they want good for the people. They want good for the flock. Not themselves and their own material gain. Money, women, power, influence. But they want good for the peasant. They want good for the dirtiest, ugliest, unattractive person. I'm trying to make a, a mentality. Is that they give dawah to each and every person. They want good for the people, even if the people aren't as handsome and beautiful and can offer them money and things like this. Who really wants good for the people? Who's really concerned for the well-being of the people? So if you use that sifter... In most cases, seven out of ten of those people will have to wait outside the room. And ten people screaming isn't like three people. Three people can sit down, can talk, can discuss. What differences do we actually have? What's factual? What's propaganda? What's a lie? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's first and foremost is you got to realize is that Allah is merciful and that Allah makes signs. Allah gives signs. Allah has not left you blind. There is always a sign to determine and to decipher even if you aren't a scholar, even if you don't have that much knowledge, you don't know Arabic, but Allah shows you things with your common sense, your fitrah, the basics of Islam to say, whoa, this can't be Islam. It's impossible. This can't be the way of the Salaf of Salih. What do you, this is how the Salaf behaved? This is what they taught? It's mustahil. It's impossible. Those beautiful men and women, the Sahaba, the Tabi, there's no way that you and what you're saying and screaming and doing is their way. Impossible. And if you don't have that and if you don't realize that, then something's off with your fitrah. Something's off with your common sense. And something's off with your fundamental knowledge of Islam and with your sincerity, your ikhlas. So those are my key pieces of advice for a new Muslim, for a beginner, for someone who's trying to learn the truth. Number one is sincerity. Be honest. Do you really feel this person is the truth? Do you really feel that in your heart? Or you like the attention, the fame, the money, the women, the this and the that? Do you really feel that this person is upon the truth and their sin? Do you really feel that? Number two is that you must use common sense. Not scholastic knowledge, but basic akal. Number three, always follow, always listen to your instincts, your, your inside. Something ain't right. It don't feel right. It didn't feel right from day one. I know what the brothers told me. He's the one. This is the one. That I know, but ah, my stomach never felt right being around this, this person. I just didn't feel right. Something was off from the get-go. You never ignore that feeling. And then, bi'idni lahi ta'ala, the fundamentals of Islam. Of course, there are issues that are above and beyond the fundamentals sometimes. There are things which are intricate. Yes, there are technicalities, ikhtilafat, ijtihadat. There are proofs and evidences on both sides, for sure. But there are many people calling to Islam, claiming that they're upon the truth, and they're saying things that go against the basic rudimentary principles of the deen. How can they be upon the truth and they're going against the basic ABCs of Islam? And last but not least is trust. You may be wrong, but I trust you. And obviously, the trust goes back to the sincerity. That's what I would say, let alone is that who's calling you to themselves, who's calling you to factual information. You only can sit with me. You can only listen to me. You can only be with me. You can only learn from me. You can only pray with me. You can only be a part. You can all, it's me, me, us, 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 me, us, me, us, me, us, me, us, me, us, me, us. That is a huge red X that that person isn't upon the truth, and that they're only calling and using Islam as a tool for their material gains. Wallahu ta'ala alam, we'll stop here. Sallallahu sallam wa barak, ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabiyina wa imamina Muhammad. Inshallah ta'ala will make a, uh, a brief five to ten minute uh, intermission, and then we'll do the brother's book signing. Inshallah ta'ala. And anyone else who would like to share any type of comments or uh, a, review, a review, if you want to leave a review or a testimonial, etc., that would be appreciated as well. That way we can further 
the movement of our Hizbiya, huh? <laughs> uh, calling to our own selves. Allah Mustan. Jazakum Allah Khair and Salaam Alaikum Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuh.